I think uh, I mean, there's several reasons for that. I think the most obvious one is environmental. Um, people spend more time outdoors. People travel more around the world. Uh, different skin uh, genetic makeups so-called Caucasian populations versus African-American populations are different and, and Western uh, people with white coloured skin travel more uh, and get more sun exposure and this skin is not meant to have sun exposure. So I think that's one reason, um, lifestyle. Number two is probably the fact that we're picking it up more. People are more, they go to their doctors more, they're more educated, they monitor their skin more regularly than people would have done in 50, 60 years ago when, you know, this, this just wasn't on the radar at all. So I think picking it up more, going to doctors more is also responsible for it. And also our record keeping is much better. So we have a very good national cancer registry based in Kinsale uh, in, 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 in this country. And the record keeping is very good. It's benchmarked in my view against the best cancer registries in, in um, equally developed countries. So we're picking up more people are going to their doctors more and lifestyle is completely different to what it was 50 years ago. So I think those reasons, possibly some ethnic reasons as well, uh, they probably explain a lot of the rise in melanoma that we're seeing. Most people go to the doctor, mm. they get the mole or whatever it is removed mm -hmm. and, and that's the end of it. Mm -hmm. For the people whose moles are removed or whose lesions are removed and there's a further story, What's the difference between them and the population that just get to walk away and forget about it? Well, I think the difference lies in the histology, lies in under the microscope. There's different criteria to assess the risk of the disease coming back or not coming back. So we can categorise melanoma now based on these criteria to low risk, intermediate risk or high risk. So this is why some patients can get a mole taken off. It's low risk under the microscope. The chances of it coming back are small and why some patients who have for example an area on the skin that's ulcerated or that's bleeding or that's maybe been neglected for many years we all have itchy moles that we do nothing about for years and they may in a lot of cases be nothing but in those cases where it turns out to be something this is clearly higher risk for occurrence than what i've just mentioned with the lower risk so i think that's what differentiates them there may be certainly coming down the pike genetic differences that we're increasingly discovering to help further characterize and quantify why something is low risk or high risk and we may be able to tell people with a great degree of accuracy in the future based on their genetic signature who's low risk and who's high risk rather than the relatively crude pathologic tools we have at the moment but that's how we categorize them at the moment. What difference has the discovery of BRAF made to melanoma medicine? I think it's made a massive, massive difference. I mean, I think there was nothing short of a, uh, a therapeutic desert when it came to treatment for melanoma from basically the early 70s when one of the chemotherapy drugs was approved in the US right up until the mid, late 90s uh, when these drugs started to be investigated in clinical trials. There's been nothing short of a quantum leap to be able to give a drug that's a tablet that acts on a specific genetic change in the tumour and to prolong somebody's life with minimal side effects, hardly ever having to, if at all, having to come into hospital. I mean, you can see how that's a major breakthrough in the disease. And um, companies and investigators are building on this big discovery now of the, of the BRAF gene and drugs that act on this gene. They're building on this with other drugs that can add to this that work on analogous pathways or downstream pathways of this BRAF change and it really the, it's very exciting the field is changing almost on a weekly basis and the results that are coming back now with long-term follow-up in these studies are really 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 very good. It's a very bittersweet time though isn't it for mm. patients and for doctors because new medicine is appearing which is fantastic equally that medicine stops working mm -hmm. after a certain length of time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What are the strategies doctors like you can develop around that? Well, I think the strategies, um, I think to focus on melanoma, really uh, there's, there's several different strategies. Number one is to try and synthesize and study drugs that act on other molecular changes apart from BRAF and perhaps give these drugs in combination. I think in the era of chemotherapy, many diseases now as routine, we give two, three, sometimes even four chemotherapy drugs together because they work invariably in different ways and the combination is synergistic, essentially additive. 
or more than additive. So the same logic applies to targeted therapy. It's not just one target that we have to hit with drugs. It's probably several targets combined together. So I think that's one strategy that's going to try and overcome resistance. Again, to focus on melanoma, we have the very exciting um, area of immunotherapy, which is really intriguing. So immunotherapy in melanoma with drugs like interferon, interleukin, and the more modern immunotherapies like ipilimumab and other drugs coming like PD-1 and others, these drugs can rewire your immune system to fight the melanoma, which is a good thing, and patients can be cured with this strategy. There's long-term follow-up now in some of these studies, three, four, even five years out from finishing the drug where disease has remained quiescent or indolent and patients are living normal lives with widespread disease. So I think in answer to your question about how do we address the issue of resistance, it's through combination targeted therapies and immunotherapies. There'll be more in your arsenal in a few years time than there is at the moment then? Absolutely, there'll be a lot more. I think this is part of the, the good thing with, uh, with my job is that we have many more tools, many more weapons to fight this disease. Uh, the difficult thing is it's becoming increasingly difficult to decide which treatment to give when or whether to give them singly, in combination, in sequence. This is all something that's evolving and the paradigms, the algorithms are becoming increasingly more complex. So this is part of the challenge about how to use these tools rationally, appropriately. And then, of course, there's the cost of them as well. And, you know, that's an issue also. BRAF is a gene that we all have. Uh, it's been shown over many years of study that this gene can be mutated, can be preferentially switched on, amplified in many cancers. So one of the cancers where this has been found is melanoma. And approximately 40, 50 percent of most melanomas have this genetic change, this BRAF amplification. And what this means essentially is, this is, if you like, an Achilles heel of the cancer, because the cancer is dependent on this amplification, on this accelerator to grow. So if we can make drugs to inhibit this accelerator, i.e. to put a brake on the accelerator, the cancer will slow down and will become starved of its fuel, so to speak, and will die. So that's the logic of a BRAF inhibitor. That's how a BRAF inhibitor works. So why it develops resistance is it's very simplistic to view melanoma as being absolutely addicted to BRAF mutations. It's not. It's addicted to multiple genetic mutations, hundreds, maybe thousands. It just science has progressed quicker in discovering the utility of BRAF mutations compared to other mutations. So if you give a BRAF inhibitor drug, in all likelihood, you will get a very big response in the melanoma. The disease will shrink, patients will feel better. But beneath the surface, there is this whole web of intrigue, if you like, like an, like an underground subway map where the BRAF pathway is like this and you shut this off well, then the trains coming down will realise that this is shut off, so they start to go along an analogous pathway, either side of the shut down pathway, and then it will become routine for the trains to go this way, and they're no longer dependent on this pathway, which they were heretofore dependent on. So that's why resistance develops, and resistance probably develops from the first day that you start taking the drug. So the logic with overcoming this resistance or the way the field is moving, is to give another drug that inhibits the main analogous pathway or downstream pathway to inhibit at two points in, in, the, in the underground map. And therefore, you would have less resistance developing in the short term. Of course, you can see the complexity of this. There's multiple pathways. And it may be that some of these other pathways are just background noise. They never take much traffic anyway. And there may be only two or three big pathways. Uh, that's remained to, to be discovered. There's certainly some diseases where there's really only one pathway predominantly and one drug can make a massive difference and can even be curative. But in melanoma, it's not that advanced yet. And it may be there's several pathways. The immune system is something obviously we all have, and this is something that's been shown over time, over the years, to be very important in melanoma. Uh, the immune system fights melanoma uh, because the melanoma cancer is a foreign cell in the body. So it's been shown over the years that if you stimulate the immune system, 
this is a good thing to fight melanoma. Your own immune system has an inherent break, has a series of checkpoints, breaks, which stop your immune system from driving all the time and from attacking itself all the time. So if you can give a drug that will block the break and cause an accelerator to the immune system, that could be a good thing in melanoma. And this in fact has shown to be the case. We have a new drug known as ipilimumab, which is an antibody, a protein, that blocks one of the immune checkpoints, which is also a block. So if you block the block, you'll open it up and you'll have a stimulation. So you will stimulate the immune system to fight the melanoma, which as I said earlier, has been shown to be a good thing. So this drug is something that's been explored. And very intriguingly, in percentages of patients, not insignificant percentages of patients, this can turn out to be a very profound event in their journey with melanoma and patients can be many years out from treatment with ipilimumab with their immune system rejigged and the disease remaining indolent and nothing happening. And melanoma invariably behaves very aggressively. So this drug has made a massive difference to this percentage of patients. I think the big challenge is to find out who these people are before we give the drug. And this is the subject of a lot of work to decide who's really going to benefit from ipilimumab before giving it uh, versus who won't. It's not for everybody. When you look at the cancer services, people talk about the standard here. You know, we, Irish patients can get access to medicines that, you mm -hmm. know, people in the state, you know, we're, we're mm -hmm. up there. Why are our survival rates not up there as well? Um, that's a good question. I think, again, as multifactorial is the answer to that. I think um, a lot of patients present with more advanced disease in Ireland. Um, screening is something that's come uh, to the country, but we're years behind other countries. Uh, but we're improving all the time. I think um, attending a doctor on a routine basis when you're well is something that heretofore has been alien to the Irish psyche. I mean, somebody told me before that, you know, you go to the doctor when you're well, not when you're sick. And that's something that's completely different to what we're used to, you go when you're sick. And with cancer, as many people well know, invariably it's advanced when it's picked up in, in a lot of cases. Whereas if it's picked up earlier, our results could be a lot better. So I, I think that's one aspect of it. I think uh, number two, um, you know, there is a significant lag period between getting the actual survival data. Um, so we're slowly but surely becoming benchmarked against the best of the uh, best countries on, on this so-called league table, whereas heretofore we weren't. And also record keeping wasn't as good in Ireland years ago as it is now. So all of these things can affect mortality data. It's just that it doesn't reflect what's actually going on today, it reflects what's going on years ago, so there's a lag effect. So I think those two aspects, record keeping and patients attending doctors when they're well, can have, can have a big impact on the, on, on, the, uh, on, the, on the mortality data that we see. I think screening is critical. I mean, it's screening is essentially um, trying to pick up a disease in an earlier stage and curing it before it gets advanced. And, and as you say, it's, it's been, we have breast cancer screening in Ireland, we have cervical cancer screening, and we're now rolling out through the NCCP colon cancer screening. So these are very welcome developments and, and all of these screening uh, for these diseases has been shown, um, although people debate it, but it has been shown in my view to improve survival. There is significant controversies around lung cancer screening, around prostate cancer screening, um, gynecologic cancer screening, etc. So it's, it's hard to prove that screening makes a difference because you need significant follow-up with patients that have been screened versus patients that haven't been screened. So this is part of the controversy. Also, the testing that's done with screening, it has to be something that's easy to do, that's not very invasive, that's financially easy to do. So all of these things can add up to make screening very difficult. 
So, I mean, my view on screening is that this is, there should be significant resources put into screening because it's better to screen detect a cancer rather than pick it up in a later stage. And probably the overall cost um, is very much in favor of screening rather than the significant resources that go into, you know, treating somebody with advanced disease with all of the adverse sequelae that can happen from that. So we've made great progress with breast cancer screening, cervical cancer screening, and now colon, we're going to see a lot more colon cancer thanks to screening, you know, which can be a good thing because we'll pick it up much earlier and patients can do much better. So screening is certainly something that I feel strongly about. I think it's something that we should look into more in other diseases. The trouble is, what is the best screening tool? That's, that's where the issue, and is it financially doable for the state to fund screening in, in diseases that may be less common, for example, than breast cancer and colon cancer? Is it, you know, too Star trek -y to dream of a future where you'd go to the doctor on your GP on your regular visit, a simple blood test or walk through something like an airport scanner, and the doctor would say, do you know what, you have a very early cancer in there and we're just going to treat that, and you walk away and it's just a minor health incident, really? Well, I think, you know, I think in our lifetime that may be a little Star Trekky, but that's certainly the way the field is going. There is no doubt in my mind that the advent of genomic gene technology, the human genome has been sequenced over 10 years now. It's probably one of the seminal scientific events in our lifetime. We know the sequence of the whole human genome. We may not know what every gene does, but that's coming. Um, and I do think within the next 30, 40 years, maybe 50 years, that we will be able to have the genetic makeup of everybody and based on that genetic makeup we will be able to predict who is likely to get a cancer and what type of cancer versus who is less likely to get a specific cancer so i think right now at the coal face this is probably something that's not ready for prime time but with the ad adjuvant of things like genome-wide association studies and things called SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms and things called deep se deep sequencing deep genome sequencing that cost hundreds of thousands of euro years ago and now costs in the low thousands i think with the advent of all these things i think it's certainly realistic in the next 50 years that we could have the genetic structure on tap of non-patients and be able to predict who will get cancer and who won't. And also our understanding of what actually causes cancer in terms of environmental risks is becoming increasingly more advanced. So this will help to pick things up earlier as well. So I think what you say about going through an airport and getting scanned and something, maybe that's a little bit too, little bit too science fiction today. But you know, I, I certainly think it's coming in the next 50 years. I certainly think something like that is eminently realistic. Cancer and cancer medicine, it's, it's a whole new language. You know, we arrive along in front of you guys and, you know, we're shocked, we're scared, we're upset. And this is a whole new world. And nothing is an absolute fact because things are changing mm. so much all the time. And the, how important is it that patients become informed? How, compared with America, what are Irish patients like in terms of finding out? Well, I think information is power. I think that's that's uh, something I feel strongly about. The more you know about something, the more likely you are to get it investigated and treated and have a better outcome. So from my experience, uh, and again, forgive the sweeping generalization, uh, patients in America are very IT savvy and are constantly on iPads, iPhones, other devices, internet, etc. And um, the you know the 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 handle on the latest medical information that's coming out in, in in this case cancer is probably better than the average patient who's not in America in Ireland for example I mean again that's a sweeping generalization but I think overall that's probably the case but I think you know that's changing uh, we have a very advanced uh, IT structure in Ireland and I think I'm increasingly seeing in my practice patients who are coming in now with articles downloaded from the web, from international newspapers, from chat rooms, from medical fora, etc., with patients on them asking, well, what about this drug? Can I have this? Or have you checked this? Or why am I having this scan? Is this available in Ireland? And I think, you know, when I was training a decade ago, this wasn't the case. So even in a short decade, I can see a huge difference in terms of baseline knowledge and thirst for knowledge amongst patients and relatives, non-patients. And I think this is good. It's an onus on me to keep up to date with everything. 
And uh, it's also good for the field that it's moving forward very quickly. And I think invariably this is going to lead to better outcomes from patients and moving the field along much quicker. A lot of the time people will say to you, oh, don't go near the internet, you'll only be frightening yourself. But the, the, and there is that aspect and mm. there are people who are frightened, you know, and you do mm -hmm. come across information maybe you'd rather not know or you haven't yes. fully appreciated up to now. But also as the medicine is changing so fast, it does become more important for the patient to actually understand what's happening around them, what's happening their disease. Absolutely, it's critical. I mean, I think your point about the internet being dangerous is well made. As somebody told me before, the internet is like having all the books in a library open face down on the floor. How do you navigate your way through this to find the book you want? I think in the area of medicine, there are regulated websites with organisations like the Irish Cancer Society, the Health Research Board, uh, the National Cancer Institute of the United States. These all have regulated medical websites that are freely accessible, freely Googleable, new term. And patients can get baseline information. There's links to scientific websites. There's links to uh, patient advocacy groups, etc. So I think you know this is something that patients should explore. Uh, this is knowledge is power. I think this is something that's certainly of huge benefit in the clinic when somebody comes in with information that they've read as long as it's from a regulated site. I think that's the key thing. I think people need to be very careful reading something that's not from a regulated government sponsored or pharmaceutical sponsored website.